Welcome to First Baptist Church of Elkin, a community of faith that seeks to love, live, grow, and go like Jesus. Regardless of who you are or where you've been, everyone is welcome, really. If this is your first time with us, we feel honored that you would choose to worship here today. In the pew rack in front of you, you'll find a visitor card. If you're interested in connecting with us and learning more about our church, then please fill out a card and place it in the offering plate when it comes by later in the service. You can also scan the QR code in the right-hand corner of the screen or on the back of your bulletin and fill this out online. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our Facebook viewers. Though we wish that you could be with us, we're so thankful that you could join us online. If this is your first time viewing the service, then please let us know in the comments section below. Here are a few things that you need to know this week. There will be a fellowship lunch after church on Sunday, July the 21st. We will have fried chicken, potato salad, coleslaw rolls, and a dessert. Please join us following worship for this time of good food and fellowship. The nominating committee is hard at work preparing for the new church year that begins September 1st. There are a lot of wonderful service opportunities, and if you've been thinking about getting more involved in the life of our church, then make sure to pick up a copy of the interest form and return it by August the 11th. You'll be able to access these forms on Realm, in your Connect Group room, and on the table in the lobby. Return your form to the office or in the drop box in the foyer. We look forward to serving alongside you this September. On Sunday, July the 21st, Mission Hearts and Hands is hosting its annual Hat Day to benefit the ARC, a local nonprofit that provides support and housing to homeless women and children. Please bring a dollar donation that Sunday and wear your favorite hat to support the ARC. If you have an announcement that needs to be shared in next week's Need to Know, then please email me by Tuesday of this week. God bless and welcome to worship. Good morning. morning. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray together. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful summer day and all the blessings that come along with it. We thank you for this time of worship where we get to gather together to honor and celebrate you. We lift up Taylor Lloyd as she shares her musical giftedness in worship and we ask your blessings on her. God, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to the gospel today. Help us embrace Jesus so that his love may flow through us. May your love and mercy not be limited by our closed-mindedness, 
Give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear as you do. Guide us, Holy Spirit, to be your presence on this earth. We grieve the state of affairs that our world is in, and we seek forgiveness for how we have contributed to the division and the hatred that we see around us. Help us to be more like Christ. We lift up Donald Trump and his staff this morning in prayer and the families of those who lost their lives at the rally yesterday. We mourn with those who mourn this morning. May we stand against evil with our Christian kindness, bring hope where there is despair, and may our love always be louder than our hatred. God, we ask that you bless this time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please join me in the response of reading. God's greatness is wondrous to behold. From the loftiest mountains to the crashing waters of the sea. God's greatness can be within the human heart. Amen. Please stand now if you're able and join us in our call to worship hymn seven, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, and kids can come down for kids' time. Kids, we'll sit on the floor today so that you can see my illustration. All right. So I've got two cups here, and they've got some water in them. What do we normally do with cups like this? We drink, we drink right? So if I wanted to drink from this, you see there's an open lid right there. Do you think water is going to flow out pretty easily from there, and you're going to be able to drink a lot of water? Yeah, right? So if I pour a little water in there, all right, we can see that it's flowing pretty well. The lid's open. Okay, so we've got that one. Now this one has a lid on it. So how do I drink this one? Yeah, so we're just going to pop the, the top there a little bit. And do you think you're going to be able to get some water out of there too? Yeah. Yeah, right? Okay, so let's try. All right. It's not as much, right? But you still get to drink some water. All right. And why is there not as much water coming out of that one? Because it's not 
yeah, it's, it's not open, and the, the hole there is a lot smaller, okay? Now, what if we thought about this in reverse? What if I wanted to put water back into the cup? Let's, let's take this one, for example. Do you think I'm going to be able to get a lot of water into this cup? No. You don't? Yeah, actually. Yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if it's got an open lid, we're probably going to be able to get some water in there, right? Yeah. So let's... Okay. The water's going in there really easily. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, but how about this one? Do you think the water's going to go no. into that one? No. no, that's right. Let's try it. Oh, man. So a little bit, right? We got a little bit of water in there, but not as much as the one with the open lid. So that illustration can help us with our Bible story today because in our scripture, Jesus is preaching in his hometown. And when he goes there, he's rejected. All of those people know him and they say, well, isn't this Mary and Joseph's son? And so he's preaching with all this authority and people don't really like it. They're closed off to his message. And so because they're kind of closed off to it, Jesus ends up not performing that many miracles in his hometown. And so he and his disciples go out to all of these other villages and they um, teach and perform miracles and heal people. And so Jesus goes to all of these villages and those people are actually open to what he has to say. And there's a lot of people who are ready to receive Jesus. And so we can kind of think about these two bottles like the towns in our story today. So one was kind of closed off, right? And so this one did not get a lot of water. And because it was closed off um, and it didn't get a lot of water, we can kind of think about that like Jesus's hometown. The people were closed off to Jesus's message. And so he ended up leaving that town. But this one was able to take a lot of water, right? Because the lid was open. Um, and so that's kind of like all of the villages that Jesus goes to and teaches at uh, because they were open to receiving Jesus's message and what he had to say. So today we can remember how important it is for us to remain open to Jesus. And we can remember that um, in the story, it wasn't individuals who necessarily rejected or accepted Jesus. It was towns of people who rejected him, and it was towns of people who accepted him. And so this church is not necessarily a town, but we are a congregation. We are a group of people, and we can help each other choose and decide to remain open to Jesus and his message. And so that's one reason why church is so important because we can help each other choose to remember to stay open to Jesus. Okay. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for um, the community that we have here. Help us to always stay open to your love and your mercy and your healing um, and help us to let that love overflow out of us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, you can head back to your seat. Good, beautiful Sunday morning. I'm Janie Helton, in case some of you don't know me yet. <laughs> when asked to share my thoughts about having or being a deacon here at First Baptist Church Elkin, I wrote this carefully thought out but brief essay on my laptop. I don't know how I did it, but I accidentally erased the whole thing. I'm, I'm good at accidentally doing things on the computer anyway. <laughs> So I took that as a sign from God to just forget all that and tell you this. Throughout my lifetime, I've tried to pay attention to what I call holy nudges. Coming to this church and joining was a holy nudge, and it became a major part of my spiritual journey, a journey which I pray never ends until I draw my last breath. Accepting the nomination as a deacon was also due to one such nudge. All you need is love, sang the Beatles quite a few years back. Well, love is a good thing to have for God, your family, your significant other, 
your fellow man, and your church family. It also helps to have a prayerful and caring heart, a listening and sympathetic ear, and an openness to meet others where they are by sharing in their illnesses, their celebrations, their joys, and their sorrows. The time requirement is minimal, but the heart requirement is great. It is an honor to serve, and that is what a deacon is, and that is what a deacon does. We serve. I'd like to share with you um, Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31 from the message, Eugene Peterson's great translation. Jesus said, the first in importance is, listen, Israel, the Lord your God is one. So love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. And here is the second, love others as well as you love yourself. There is no other commandment that ranks with these. Thank you. This morning, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our, uh, our guest musician. A few months back, I had been asked to uh, help with a fundraiser for Hugh Chatham Memorial Hospital. And uh, one of the guests for that fundraiser was Miss Taylor Lloyd. Uh, and she, Ms. Uh, Taylor was crowned in 2023 the 85th Miss North Carolina. Uh, and as part of her passion is Miss North Carolina, she promotes her community service initiative of Healing Hearts Through the Arts. And that's an art advocacy, advocacy nonprofit that promotes the arts as a tool for mental health and well being. Uh, so it's been my privilege over the last couple of months to get to know Taylor and welcome her to worship. So please join me in welcoming her. Amen. Thank you, Taylor, for being with us and sharing the gift of your voice with us in worship today. Let's bow our heads for the pastoral prayer. Loving and gracious God, we call upon your name today with, with deep gratitude for who you are and for how you welcome us into this 
deep moment of dialogue that we call prayer. You are a God of radical welcome whose love has never turned anyone away and whose ears have always listened to the sounds of our voices. Lord, today's text is a challenging text that compels us to consider how we so easily resent and reject the mission that you have for us and the transformation that you desire to see in us. So help us, O Lord, uh, to truly mean it when we pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We repent for how you came to live among us and were rejected. We grieve for how you were rejected even in your own hometown. And we are mindful of the fact that even now we have walls erected that prevent us from experiencing you in your fullness. At the same time, O oh Lord, while we are guilty for how we reject your will and your yearning in our lives, we are grateful that you can identify with those moments in our lives when we have experienced rejection and resentment. And that is a struggle that you know all too well. And so we thank you today for your resilience, resilience that you have bestowed upon your church. And help us to always press on discerningly in the face of adversity and resistance, but to always press on with the great spirit of love that defines us as the body of Christ. I pray, Lord, for the continued growth of our church spiritually, numerically, and financially, so that you can expand your vision for us here at First Baptist. And I pray that growth in all of its forms will cause us to look not inward, but to continue looking outward. For your word tells us that to whom much is given, much shall be required. Lord, I lift up all among us who are sick and grieving, those who are lonely and experiencing mental and emotional and spiritual struggles. And Lord, today I continue to pray for our country the violent rhetoric that has defined our political atmosphere for too long has yet again resulted in physical violence with some injured and another American dead. I pray, Lord, that this tragedy of violence will not be used as yet another political launching pad or a catalyst for wicked conspiracy theories. And rather, I pray, God, that it will compel us to plant new seeds of civility that will blossom into a new world and generation and culture of respect and decency and accountability. Help our country, Lord, to redefine what it means to win because when we resort to physical violence and to verbal attacks and to the continued avoidance of the truth, we all lose. And when it comes, O oh God, to what really matters in America, today we can all agree that we are losing. As your church, O oh God, help us to model the way forward, the way of community, of light and love, of truth and dignity, and to remember that your kingdom is not of this world. We pray now, O God, as one body, the prayer that you taught us to pray, together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next uh, music selection this morning, you'll notice in your order of worship that uh, Lauren Kirkpatrick is supposed to join us and sing part of this. Unfortunately, Lauren uh, has covid uh, so please join me in remembering her this week as she uh, continues to recover, and we are, welc or we are more than grateful to have our friend Sarah Carr, uh, Carr step in and take her place. Uh, this morning's uh, piece is not in English, so to help you with that, it is Pie Jesu, Merciful Jesus, Qui tolis peccata mandi dona eis requiem, which means, who takes away the sins of the world, grant them rest everlasting.
Let's pray. Dear God, your love touches and guides us in many different ways. We offer the fruit of your love, the gifts of what we have and who we are, for use in your service. Inspire us to see the needs of those around us. Work through us to heal your broken world. In your name we pray. Amen. morning. Our scripture this morning is from Mark chapter 6 verses 1 through 13. Then he went out from there and came to his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come he began to teach in the synagogue and many hearing him were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him? that such mighty works are performed by his hands. 
Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Also he said to them, In whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. These words are a gift from God. Thanks be to God.
Taylor, you hit some notes that I didn't know existed on that one. Uh, Beyond the beautiful way in which she sings, I'm grateful for the strong message and music as she has just taken us all uh, really back home to the centrality of who we are and who God is in, in Jesus Christ and what a beautiful launching point for this sermon today entitled Homecomings. There's a sign, I think it's still there, over, as most of you know, I grew up here and uh, came back home to pastor, and there's a, a sign over by the Salem Fork Ballpark that says these simple words, there's no place like home, and as Little Mountain Park Tigers, we knew that when we showed up to play Little League Baseball at Salem Fork, that uh, that, that home cooking was going to be tough. There's something about the word home, isn't there? Just hearing the word home does something for us. We don't have to say much else. It is such a sweet word. Last week, Mercy's Well took some of you back home with that very nostalgic song where they invited you to remember that King James Bible and holding Grandma's hand on a church pew and all of you were smiling and grinning throughout that song and tapping your feet. I remember those days and many of you do too. When you think of home, what comes to mind? What are the sights that come to your mind? What are the sounds? What are even the smells that come to mind when you think of home? I've always loved being able to go back home. I can walk right into my parents' house, the place where I was raised. I can open the refrigerator and get whatever I want. I can open the microwave and usually find a piece of cornbread from last night or a homemade biscuit. It's always there. And if it's close to mealtime, my mother always knows to cook just enough for somebody else. And if it's two people who show up, there's just enough for them to home, a place of peace and a place of comfort with a never-ending spirit of welcome I'm thankful today that I can never remember a time in my life when I didn't feel as though I couldn't go back home. And that's how it should be. But you know, coming back home to Surrey County was not all that easy. There are still a few preachers that I run into at the grocery store that turn and go the other way over just a few subtle theological differences that we may have. But the truth is that pity story is a story that's hardly worth telling. Because there are homecoming stories far worse than that one. R.C. was my buddy, uh, my congregant. He was a Vietnam veteran, a man who had given up so much for his country, yet he was greeted with booze and spat upon when he returned. Memories that would forever be in his mind that were forever entangled with the pain and the horrors of war that he experienced in the jungles of Vietnam. We had a good friend in college who we knew could never go back home because her dad was convinced that she married the wrong guy due to his race. Another who married the wrong gender in his dad's eyes, and he too couldn't go back home. But there are even more painful stories than that, stories of those who left home and did everything wrong, and the embarrassment was so great that they knew that they could never go back home. Yet even still, there are worse stories than that, stories of those who left home, did everything wrong, and then turned their life around and started doing everything right, and they still couldn't go back home because the embarrassment and because the pain was just too much. Home, such a sweet name, but homecomings, historically not always so sweet. And today's lesson greets us with this homecoming tension as Jesus goes back to Nazareth. And I wonder what the sights were that really triggered him and gave him all of the feels, if you will, in his heart and his mind and his soul. For me, when I top the ridge over at the Mulberry Church Road and I see the steeple of the little Bessie Chapel Church in the mountains in the background, whether I was coming home from college or whether I was coming home from my most recent deployment, that was a moment that just brought a smile and tears to my eyes because I knew that I was home. And I would imagine that something like that happened to Jesus when he went back home. And so much had changed for him in such a short amount of time. We can't know for sure how long that Jesus has been gone, but this man who was apparently pretty devoted to his upbringing, he has changed a little bit. 
Apparently, he left home as the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Judas and Simon. And they said, is this not his sisters who are here with us? This is how they remembered Jesus. They remembered him as a carpenter. They remembered him as Mary's boy. They remembered him as a sibling. That's how he left. But he has now returned full of wisdom and full of stature with a big target on his back for all of this messianic and prophetic stuff that they thought he was spewing. I came across a story from Will Campbell this week that's told in his memoir, a memoir, Brother to a Dragonfly. He tells of preaching on Youth Sunday as a teenage preacher, and you'll love this story since next week is Youth Sunday. He writes that on that Sunday, I could have denounced Christianity as a capitalistic myth, and our youth choir sung Ukrainian folk songs, and our Sunday school superintendent could have lectured on the origin of species, and all of the people would have stood up and clapped and said, Amen. Don't try it. But for what reason? Well, because the kids are in church where they're supposed to be. It doesn't matter what these kids sing or what they say. They're in church. They're in our worship service. We're raising them in the, trans- in the tradition of our ancestors. And whatever you do, don't ever discourage a child or a teenager for trying to do something for the kingdom of God. But let them go away to that their university to that seminary that folks in my upbringing called the cemetery. Or let them come home from Chapel Hill after taking Bart Ehrman's introduction to the New Testament. Let them leave and encounter a world of philosophical and theological and political and sociological viewpoints that are foreign to us, and suddenly our posture towards them changes. As Bill Leonard used to say, one generation's heresy is the next generation's orthodoxy. Here comes Jesus. No longer just a carpenter aspiring to be a rabbi. Jesus is a prophet. He is the Messiah, the Son of God, but he's still human. And my point is Jesus feels all of the pain of their resistance when he comes back home. These are his aunts and these are his uncles and his cousins and his friends and his neighbors. These are the people who taught him Hebrew and Maybe changed his diaper in the church nursery. These are the men who Jesus admired. He was probably a boy sweeping up the sawdust from around their feet. These people who helped make him who he is, yet they cannot accept who and what he has become. And that hurts. And Jesus stands in solidarity with every person that has ever felt just like that. Sometimes the people who know us best are the people who appreciate us in life the least. Bob Setzer writes that they were astounded by Jesus the man, but they were annoyed by Jesus the prophet. And the big question for us as we interpret this passage today is why. And I think the answer to that question is probably threefold. And first I would say that familiarity breeds contempt. And in each of our lives we've discovered the truth in that statement. They struggled to see Jesus as anything other than how they had always seen him. Sometimes we too struggle to see people for what they have become because all we can see is what they have always been. And that applies in a number of different ways in life. And secondly, I think there was probably a little bit of bitterness and a little bit of jealousy too. I mean, why is Jesus out there casting out demons and healing the sick and raising the dead? Has he forgotten where he came from? He ought to take care of us first before he goes into Jerusalem, the big city, and causes a scene. Has Jesus forgotten that we were the ones who raised him and the ones whom he should be loyal to? And then third, and probably the the biggest reason, is they were scared. They were scared of who he was. There was a target on Jesus' back, and everybody knew it. Life would have been so much simpler for all of them if Jesus would just shut up. Jesus is going to get himself crucified if he doesn't behave Or worse, Jesus might get us crucified. They didn't even have to have a security team when Jesus left town. But here he is. The greater fear, however, is the fear of change. And it is change that Jesus is demanding in his hometown. His radical teachings were challenging them at their core. And they were initially astounded at him. And this all makes sense, they thought. But 
Then they were offended by him because it demanded so much of them. And then they were in disbelief. And then I think probably what happened in Jesus' hometown is tribalism began to take over. And Jesus didn't stand a chance in Nazareth. So where, let me ask you, where do you best connect with this story? We can all relate to Jesus in some way. But we can also relate to Jesus' family and the community as well. Just some probably good folks who were just going about their days, just trying to live life. Someone surely said, Jesus, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But Jesus' ministry was intent on calling them and is always intent on calling us to consider the brokenness in our world that we either purposely ignore or that which we're just simply unable to see. Jesus always calls our attention to broken people and to broken institutions and to broken, broken hearts. And his authority to speak in the ways that he does in this text, they come from all of these powerful acts that he has been doing that proved his divinity. But regardless of his power, the record says that, that Jesus could do no deeds of power there. And it certainly wasn't because Jesus was powerless. It's interesting because in our last sermon two weeks ago, you may remember in Mark's gospel, Jesus has, uh, has, has raised one from the dead. He has healed a woman with an issue of blood. And after spending some time on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, he cast a demon out of a man into the swine, a man that the Bible tells us couldn't even be held down with chains. But in today's passage, in his hometown, in the culture that Jesus understood the best, it seems that his power is in chains. And the resistance that he faces here is far more challenging than a pesky demon or a woman with an issue of blood or even the death angel itself. But what Jesus is dealing with in his hometown is belief, belief systems, and nostalgia. He's dealing with expectations. He's dealing with resistance. He's dealing with established minds. Ultimately, what Jesus deals with in his hometown is what he dealt with everywhere that he went. And that was the power of culture. And General Mattis, who I admire and have quoted many times before, often says... That culture will eat strategy for lunch. That's good, isn't it? So there's an invitation for all of us when we, read, when we read the scriptures to do a culture check. And Jesus seemed to appreciate the culture of his upbringing, especially the religious culture. He appreciated the cultural uh, religious festivities of his day. But any time that culture or religious culture, God in the way of loving and living in solidarity with one's neighbor, Jesus always challenged and confronted that culture. You see, Jesus knew the culture of Nazareth very well, but he could do no deeds of power there because he's confronted with a culture of resistance defined by what this text calls and what blossoms into full-blown disbelief. I think we all know that much of the resistance that churches in America have faced over the years has had absolutely nothing to do with God and everything to do with culture. And our Jesus knew that all too well, didn't he? So he developed a strategy, and I just love this, that was in direct response to this culture that he understood very well. Jesus tells the disciples, so this is what it is that you're going to do. You're going to go out in pairs of two, and you're going to take nothing except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts, and you're going to wear uh, sandals, and don't wear two tunics. And whatever you do, he says, don't overstay, you're welcome. Now there's a lot of reflection on why Jesus adopts this particular strategy. It seems that he's challenging them to move about in such a way that their motivations in this ministry will not be challenged as his were and also to prevent them from developing the false illusion that they could do this on their own they're going to need the power of God if they're going to be successful in some an extra tunic is not going to save them and they're not going to have their family to rely on either the only thing they can rely on is the power of God You may recall another confrontation that Jesus had over in the Gospel of Matthew. Someone said, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And Jesus replied to them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, here is my mother and here are my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, Jesus said, is my brother and is my sister and is my mother. That's not unlike the bold commission that Jesus gives the disciples in today's text. 
He says, essentially, when you've done everything that you can do, and this applies to so many situations in life, when you've done everything that you know to do, if it doesn't work, Jesus says, and I quote, to shake the dust off your feet and move on. You see, this sort of mirrors Jesus' homecoming text. He shows up. He preaches just as he did everywhere else. He experiences rejection and failure. So he shakes the dust off his feet and he sends the disciples to do the exact same work somewhere else. And what happens? They go about and suddenly they're casting out demons again and curing the sick. Everything that they'd experienced everywhere else through the ministry of Jesus. Now in this gospel, much of this is related to the sense of urgency that I think is very unique to the gospel of Mark. Where Jesus moves quickly from one place to the other for the sake of his mission. Now, I think our application of this particular part of the story is one that warrants a bit of of caution because in our culture, I think we can all agree that people are probably way too quick to kick the dust off their feet and just move on. So let me say that in this particular context and in our context, the gospel steps towards reconciliation with people should prevail. The law of neighborly love still applies no matter how bad you want to kick the dust off your feet and turn and go the other direction. But the big message for me is this, and I want you to hear this. For every single one of you, your life is short. Your opportunities to make a difference in this world, they're few, they're short. And the older I get, the more clear this becomes. That God has a mission for every single one of your lives. That God has a mission for my life. God has a mission for this church. And there should be a sense of urgency about that mission. And if you spend all of your life trying to please your family, if you spend all of your life trying to make somebody else happy, if you spend all of your life trying to please your culture and trying to please your professors and trying to appease some mold that someone else thinks you should fit into, trying to be what someone else thinks that you should be, then you will never accomplish what it is that God has called you to do in this short and deeply meaningful life. And so sometimes, sometimes we do need to change. We should always be changing and growing in the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Sometimes the reason your life may not be prospering is because what you really need is a change of scenery. You need a change of setting, a change of support system, and a change of culture. So let me say this. Let us always be slow to shake the dust off our feet. But in the Bible, Jesus says that don't ever be afraid if you need to, to shake the dust off your feet. In the context of today's passage, Jesus discovered that they were not open to the mission of God in the world. He was rejected in his hometown. I don't know, maybe that deeply impacted how he understood home. Maybe that deeply impacted, certainly did, how he understood what it means to be family Because Jesus' strategies for ministry simply continued to redefine how he understood home and family. Do you remember that story that Jesus told the prominent Pharisee about the man who invited the prominent guests who all made excuses and they didn't show up? One who bought a field, purchasing an ox for another, getting married, but nobody showed up. Nobody responded to the invitation to the banquet. So the master said, We'll go out quickly into the streets, sense of urgency, in the alleys of the town and bring in the poor. Go out and bring in the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant came back and said, I've done exactly what you told me to do, but there's still room. This is Jesus' strategy that remarkably changes the culture And there is always more room wherever God is. Because Jesus says that those who do the will of our Father in heaven, that is who our family is. And family is what makes home, home. Making our home with God means that we're always building bigger tables and longer tables for more guests. Because we are a family that is drawn together by the ways and the radical love of Jesus our Lord. You know, there are so many strategies out there for congregational growth. Just go to the local Bible bookstore and look to the end cap, and you'll find some that are bestsellers and others that aren't great sellers. But so many gimmicks and so many books and so many consultants, and the list goes on. But the greatest strategy for growth, I think, 
is to reject all of the cultural fears that keep Jesus out. And they are so many. And embrace the simple strategies that Jesus has laid out in the Gospels. Strategies that pay particular attention to the meaning, the biblical meaning of home. A few weeks ago, some of you noticed, I had a couple of colleagues who visited um, our church. I went to seminary with them, and uh, Stuart, he's using his master divinity and teaching at an inner city school that had a school shooting um, just a couple of, couple of years ago, and he has pastored and ministered through that. Amy is using her MDiv uh, at a not-for-profit that seeks to elevate women, but they're both very, very involved in uh, their congregation there in South Carolina. And they really love our motto here at First Baptist that everyone is welcome, really. But these days, as we think about the growth and development of our own congregation, um, I think I might love their church's motto just a little bit more. And it's quite simply, welcome home. Welcome home. I believe that's the end goal for Christ's church. As much as I love everyone is welcome, really, you know, everyone is welcome, really, at Walmart. (laughs) They really are. And there's someone that will give our door greeters a run for their money when you walk in the door. Everyone is welcome at Elkin Municipal Park. Everyone is welcome at Ollie's, I think, and they're opening up in a few days, and I'm pretty excited about, about that. But none of those places feel like home. It is my hope that at First Baptist Elkin, that it will not always just be a place where everyone is welcome, really. But more than that, where everyone who walks into these doors will experience this sentiment of welcome home. Because in the kingdom of God, home is anywhere that Jesus lives. A place where love and grace always stand alongside expectation and accountability. It's a place where we don't struggle to get volunteers in the nursery. Because at home, I don't know about when you go to grandma's, but there's always somebody willing to rock the babies. In fact, at our house, they fight over who's going to rock the babies. The kind of place where, where musical preferences don't matter anymore. I'm glad that we finally overcame that because at home we're all uniquely gifted and and created. We are who God has created us to be, where everyone pitches in their time and their money because home means something to you. It feels like home to me around here, not just because I'm from here, but because I pastor a church where Jesus lives. I mean, who else has opera singing and a southern gospel trio in the same service last week? Feels like home. Where else can you go to church in this demographic where things like race and orientation and gender are all secondary to our expectation that we simply live as God's chosen ones? Holy and beloved, St. Paul writes, where we do our best to exemplify the fruits of the Spirit where we support one another like family, a place that respects tradition but doesn't worship it, a place that embraces change but only when it's Christ-centered and Spirit-led, and a place whose guest list is not determined by culture and social status and rather by, rather by love and mission, but most of all, a home, a place where prodigal sons and prodigal daughters No matter what they have done, no matter where they have been, but where they are all not just welcome really, but welcome truly to come and experience the grace and the dignity and the goodness of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's bring this sermon to a close. Maya Angelou once said that the ache for home lives in all of us. And T.S. Eliot once said that home is where we all start from. And for each of us, our journeys began with God as people created in the image of God. And the ache in all of us is that we will return home to God again and again and again and again. And so today I offer you this invitation. You may be listening online, you may be in the sanctuary today, and you may be feeling far, far from home, far, far from God. But Jesus knows how you feel because he too has felt the rejection of home But Jesus has never felt rejection from God 
And you don't have to experience rejection from God either. But today you can receive the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ who is our Lord. This morning, I know that many of you are looking for a place, a church to call home. And this is a church where everyone is welcome, really. But it is especially a place where Jesus is welcome. And wherever Jesus is welcome, I think we all know that everyone is welcome. And we would love to say to you those beautiful words, welcome home. If you have a prayer need today that you need to share with me as Lance comes to sing us, to lead us in our hymn of response, I'll be down front uh, to greet you. May the Spirit speak to you as we lift our voices now in song, and may you respond today as the Holy Spirit leads. Hymn 285. today for your faithfulness in worship here at First Baptist. This morning I'm delighted to share with you that, uh, that Katie and Jennifer Welburn uh, come seeking to, to transfer uh, their membership. Uh, Katie from the Stony Point Baptist Church and Jennifer from the, the Union Baptist Church here to First Baptist Church of Elkin and unite with us in, in membership. So let's give them a warm welcome to the family. Welcome. And a big round of applause. Um, 
Katie and Jennifer have become and their children, dear friends to so many of us. They've been a part of our Hashtag Adulting Connect group for a good while now, and so uh, they are already a part of us, but we are delighted that they are now going to be formally a part of our family of faith here at uh, First Baptist Elkin, and we'll invite them to join me by the side doors in just a moment. I know folks will want to, will want to greet you on, uh, on, their, on their way out. Uh, I want to thank you again, Taylor, for being with us today. Just such beautiful singing. We wish you well in all of your endeavors moving forward. And I haven't met your parents yet, but I assume that the lady who filmed every single <laughs> lyric was mom and that uh, this is dad. And so thank you all for coming and supporting her and being with us in worship uh, this day. Uh, we have a treat in store for you all uh, next Sunday, Pastor Lance is bringing uh, the sermon. Uh, he preached his first sermon, I guess it was, uh, his homily on uh, the sunrise service. You always give that 6 a.m., 7 a.m. sermon to the associate pastor, right? And, uh, but he survived that and did a great job. So um, I'll be on vacation next week, going up to Maryland to visit uh, Katie's family. So um, uh, Lance will be preaching. And Cyrus Bush uh, from First Baptist Church, Winston-Salem, and many of you know him. He's been here before, a great musician. Uh, he will be uh, co-leading in, in that worship service. So come out, support Lance. Uh, next week. Also, there's a catch-up meal right after worship next week, uh, so we appreciate, uh, we, Gail, we haven't forgotten about your good cooking, and our meals won't resume until uh, the fall, but so we have a catch-up meal next Sunday right after church, so stay, uh, so come and uh, be, be prepared to share in a good meal together. And then finally, we pray for our youth ministry. Uh, Pastor Justin will be taking our youth the passport this week. We wish you all well. I know that it'll be a great week of fellowship and learning and growth uh, together. And then the Sunday after next will be, as I mentioned earlier, um, Youth Sunday, and we have have Martha Bassett from the Martha Bassett Show at Reeves Theater. Uh, they're going to be leading that service together. And before we go, um, I, I knew that Martha was a big deal, but I didn't realize what a big deal Martha was until I reported to my, this new Marine Corps unit that I'm supporting as a Navy chaplain. And, uh, and I was with our lieutenant who pastors the Church of the Incarnation in Long Island. And so he and I were having a conversation, and we were walking a, across their, their church campus uh, across the street to eat lunch. And, and he goes, wait a minute, Elkin, Elkin. And he said, is the Martha Bassett show in Elkin? And I said, yeah, it is. And uh, he said, oh, he said, I, I faithfully listen to the Martha Bassett show. The dean of the cathedral, the Church of the Incarnation in Brooklyn, New York, uh, is a big Martha Bassett fan. So it's really, really cool that we've got Martha Bassett uh, coming to, to First Elkin, and, and we just can't wait to see what kind of creative and meaningful worship service that you all, you all put together. So it's an exciting month for us, and uh, we appreciate uh, your continued support and love for our church. Let's bow, and I'll offer you this, this benediction. And now as we go forth from this place as uh, the people of God, a family of faith committed to who God has called us to be, let us go forth as a grateful people, possessing with love whatever God has given us and occupying with grace whatever space or influence that we've been granted and serving with boldness in all the missions that we have been called to. Go now as a people of power, go as a people of purpose, and go as a people of promise, proclaiming the love and the grace and the mercy and the power of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. Amen.